I want to welcome you all to uh, a little webinar this morning. Thanks for joining me. It's the first day of spring, right? Uh, you wouldn't know it outside here. It's about 30 degrees outside, maybe 35. But hey, it's coming at some point. So it's a good time to talk about infrared photography. And I'm going to share my screen here. And hopefully you guys can all see this. Now, if you have questions, I'm going to take questions at the end, and please just type them in the in the chat window. That way, we don't have everybody coming off of um, mute, and um, it, it's going to be really crazy with as many people as we have um, in the group today. So, this is discovering digital infrared photography. I'm Jason O'Dell, as you may know, and my website is luminescentphoto.com, as you also probably know. But if you didn't, now you do. And um, infrared photography is is a really fun thing that I've been doing for almost 10 years now. I got into it um, in around 2013, 2014, I want to say. So here's the agenda for today. Um, a little introduction to what infrared photography is, how it works. And I want to provide some inspiration and examples from the field. Uh, so I'll be sharing a lot of my photos that I've uh, collected over the last oh, 10 years or so. I'm going to talk a little bit about my processing. This is not a processing class. I'm just going to talk about um, why I use uh, Lightroom uh, Camera Raw to process my infrared images, because it's a little bit different than what most people consider paradigm out there. And um, I'm also going to share my uh, infrared kit. So let's get started um, with an introduction to digital infrared photography. Now, digital infrared capture um, is really cool, but in order to kind of get our heads wrapped around it, I want to talk a, a few things. Um, talk about what infrared light is versus visible light, how we can use infrared as a creative tool, when we shoot an infrared, when is it good, and then a little bit on how to capture infrared images, at least from a top level. Okay, so I'm going to start off with... Um, the, the very fundamental, this is the only physics slide you're going to get in the presentation, um, but this is um, the electromagnetic spectrum that you probably learned about or tried to forget about a long, long time ago. And it ranges um, in, in um, it, this is just energy, and it's, it's waves that go from really uh, short cosmic rays um, and they're measured in meters. You can see it's like 10 to the minus 12. That's really tiny. So, so things that are extremely long wave bands, like broadcast, these are long waves, a you know, kilometer long or longer. Now, we are here, <laughs> right here. This is where we live. This is the visible spectrum. And it's where we are able to see. It's, it's most of the light that hits Earth is in this spectrum, or at least that's what our eyes are tuned to see. We, we can see other, there's other kinds of energy hitting the earth. Um, infrared, ultraviolet, that's what gives you the sunburn, right? UV, infrared, and heat. Um, and there's all kinds of other stuff floating around out there. You know, when you turn on your microwave oven, um, uh, radar, all that stuff is floating around radio waves. But what we see is in this visible band, and it ranges um, in wavelength, is measured in this tiny little unit called nanometers. Okay, uh, they're very, very small. And uh, we basically can see down here at the bottom, if we blow this rainbow spectrum up, we can see between around 400 to about 700. That's so starting with the indigo and the violet you're down around 400 nanometers moving through you get in the blues the greens the yellows and then the reds now if we go beyond either end of that spectrum you find yourself in 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 a territory which is not visible um, but very close in wavelength to what we do see and that's infrared up here in the beyond the red ir and down below the violet we have ultraviolet now, what we're going to talk about today is going to be infrared photography. And when I say infrared, I'm really talking about things that are, oh, 720 nanometers and higher. 720 to 850 nanometers is the near infrared spectrum. There's other kinds of things you may have heard about. You may have think about thermal imaging. Well, that's that's way out here. That's heat. That's thousand uh, nanometer or more. And we don't capture that with our with our cameras. Okay. 
Now, infrared photography is an incredibly powerful creative tool, and, I, and it's one of the reasons why I really enjoy it, okay? Um, so there's a shot that I got um, with an infrared camera here in Colorado. Um, but obviously, you can tell that it, it just creates a unique look to your images. Um, skies and clouds become more dramatic. Infrared light can penetrate haze. So if you've got a lot of hazy moisture in the air, um, it can penetrate that and clean up um, haze uh, that would look you know, bright and hazy in a visible uh, spectrum camera. Um, foliage often becomes bright or even white um, depending on the wavelength that you're using in your camera. Um, and highlights can sometimes glow or we can use post-processing to make them glow. But traditional infrared film, for example, often had this sort of glowing, what they called halation look to it. And you can sometimes capture greater highlight detail. Um, and one of the cool things about infrared is that it renders really smooth skin tones um, in portraits because infrared light, unlike visible light, reflects from about a millimeter below the surface of your skin, your epidermis in biological terms. So, so lots of fine lines, wrinkles, and even freckles can sometimes disappear entirely if you photograph someone with your infrared camera. Now, when should you shoot infrared? Most people think infrared is midday, bright sun, white clouds, and that's fine because it gives us the opportunity to shoot in the middle of the day. Um, but you can shoot infrared at any time. You're just going to get a different look. So if it's an overcast day or there's uh, storms or fog, early morning, late afternoon, sometimes people even photograph infrared at nighttime, you know, blue hour. Um, that's, and even I've seen people do astrophotography of the Milky Way with an infrared camera. But, but one of the nice things about infrared is because it works so well pretty much any time of the day, especially in the midday, it gives you an extended shooting time um, for, for times and places where maybe you don't, you can't get somewhere for sunrise or golden hour or twilight. A lot of times you might be on a vacation or traveling and you just don't have the opportunity to get somewhere, you know, you're with a group or something like that and you're just not going to be able to get somewhere and you're, you're stuck shooting middle of the day. Infrared is incredibly powerful for travel photography for this reason. Another thing about infrared that's very cool is that anything that is wet gets enhanced by infrared because it starts getting darker and it creates more contrast. Wood, metal, leaves, deep water, um, it can be darker. You can see all kinds of uh, differences in your shot, depending on what, what's in the scene. And I got this pro tip from Tony Sweet, who's a great friend of mine, and I learned a lot about infrared from him. He carries a squirt gun, bring a super soaker, and uh, take it with you, and you can spray things down. But in any of this, experimentation is always going to be key. And that's true for not only um, every kind of photography, but especially infrared photography. Um, so whether it's dry versus wet, you know, you bring a squirt gun or whatever you might want to do, um, you need to play around. And frankly, that's what makes this so fun. There's a lot of opportunity to just play around both in the field and on your computer in post. Okay, so let's talk about how to actually capture and record infrared images. And there's really traditionally two ways, not counting film, okay, because that was one option. You can use a lens-mounted filter, or you can use a digital camera that's been converted to capture infrared, okay? So let me talk a little bit about filters first, okay? If you just put an infrared filter on your lens, like a 72R, you know, Hoya 72R filter, it's an IR filter, um, what happens is, is that the only thing that gets through to the sensor is infrared light. Now, in a perfect world, this would be fine and it would work, but there's some limitations to this. The first problem is that every digital camera pretty much nowadays um, has what's called a hot mirror or IR cut filter on the sensor itself. It's part of the glass that's on top of your sensor. It's, to, it's there for a reason. Infrared light 
contaminates visible light images. And early on in digital photography, there were a lot of images where if you had a photo, maybe it had a specular highlight from water reflections or chrome, like a bumper uh, chrome reflection, you would see blue and purple extending from the, from the, the reflection of the, the sun. That's called blooming and it was bad. It was caused by infrared light. So camera manufacturers very, very early on figured out that they needed to include an IR cut filter as part of their um, sensor uh, glass, okay? So the, the, the bottom line is two problems now. One, um, if you're gonna do infrared photography with a traditional camera and just use a filter, the exposure times are incredibly long. You might, you, you're, you're stuck using a tripod, you might have to use extremely high ISOs or several minute long exposures. Now that's creative in its own, own sense, but it's not very convenient for walking around and doing um, casual infrared photography. The other problem is that if you put this filter on, you can't see anything. And, and this, is, this is a problem because you're not gonna be able to see, you're not gonna be able to focus, you're gonna have to do everything pre-shot focusing all that kind of stuff and then put the filter on so it's really kind of a pain and that's why most of us these days do the second option which is get an infrared camera conversion and in this process you send your camera off for a couple hundred dollars they will replace the normal glass that's over your uh, sensor with one that allows infrared light to pass through it and it will effectively block most visible light the advantage of this is that the, the filtration occurs at the sensor level, meaning you can look through your viewfinder or use live view or a mirrorless um, EVF and just see the, the image normally. That's huge for, for being able to, to compose. And the other nice thing about a camera conversion is that your shutter speeds tend to be reasonable. The higher you go in the infrared um, spectrum, the longer the shutter speeds tend to be. But again, with most cameras now, you know, you can bump the ISO up a little bit. You're not going to be having to do minute long exposures. Now, what's the right camera? Okay, there's a lot of stuff to consider, and I'm happy to, to advise people on this all the time. But you should really consider a few things if you're going to convert a camera. You can convert mirrorless cameras. You, convert, you can convert um, DSLRs. And a lot of people traditionally have converted their DSLR because they had one lying around. It was an extra, extra camera, right? And certainly that's um, a valid option. However, um, you want to have a camera that allows for some form of live view focusing, whether it's through the back of the LCD on a DSLR or a mirrorless camera that has it just by default through the electronic viewfinder. If you can use live view focusing, you'll get better focus accuracy than if you try to use a DSLR um, with its focusing module through the, through the viewfinder, okay? That's a known issue about infrared. So mirrorless cameras don't suffer from that problem at all. And DSLRs, you need to use live view. The other thing to consider if you're trying to get a camera, depending on what you have, is whether or not the lenses are any good. Um, there is a lot of good lenses out there, but not all of them work really well with infrared. One of the things I've done over the years, along with, with uh, Rick Walker, my podcast uh, partner and others, is I've got a database or a list basically on my website of all of the lenses that I've tested um, with my Nikon kit um, as to whether or not they're any good for infrared. Um, there's a problem with, with in, they don't design lenses for infrared go figure. So with today's lenses, you, you can sometimes run into problems that you just can't really fix. And those things include bright areas in the center of the frame or hot spots, and they're a pain in the butt to deal with. Some lenses have them, some lenses don't. The other thing about today's lenses is that the optical coatings, which help get sharp corners in your, in your um, photos, uh, those optical coatings tend to not be designed to work with infrared light. And the optical coatings do a tremendous amount of uh, work in improving uh, corner sharpness in wide angle lenses. So sometimes the corners will go to absolute mush um, with a wide angle lens on infrared, even though it might be a great lens with visible light. 
Another thing you want to consider if you're getting a camera conversion infrared is its form factor. How big is it? Um, um, because, you know, depending on how you plan to use it, if it's a dedicated infrared camera, it becomes a second body potentially to carry along. So you want one that's going to be compatible with your existing kit, um, or there's some other options you can do I'll talk about um, shortly. You can convert pretty much any camera to infrared, including compact point and shoots. And for a long time, people really liked converting things like the Canon G series point and shoot cameras to infrared because they produced a raw file and it's very easy it's just compact you toss it in your bag and you play around with it and they're not expensive if you're not sure about whether your camera can be converted to ir just contact the company that does the conversions I'll, and, and there's a couple of them out there that i recommend so you've decided to convert your camera to infrared and now you have the big problem which is which conversion do you pick um, Conversions are sometimes given names, but almost always they're they're labeled by their wavelength. So back to that picture that I had with the with the various uh, cutoff wavelengths, the higher the number, the less visible light comes in, and the more it just captures pure infrared images. Okay, so if you get something in the 780 and up range, 780, 830, 810, sometimes even 850 you are going to produce monochrome images, period. There will be no color, no matter what you do. And all you have to do is convert them to black and white in post and you're done and you can adjust them. So it's very easy to work with these files, but they're very limited in what you can do with them. You're going to get black and white, no matter what you do. The traditional wavelength is 720 nanometers, sometimes called standard infrared. This is your all-purpose infrared conversion. It's going to give you bright white foliage and some color, and it's going to depend on how you process. I'll talk about that. Um, but it's going to be mostly monochrome looking with white, bright foliage, those, those white leaves. And you can get that nice, um, soft uh, sort of ethereal effect, again, depending on how you process it. Now, as we move below 720, remember 720 was kind of our, our cutoff threshold for, for where visible light comes in. We're in the red zone. Now we're going to go into the visible zone. So 665, that's more in the, in the reds into the yellows. This is allowing a little bit of visible light to come in along with that infrared component. This is better when you want to do some work with color in your files. And one effect is called the blue sky effect through a technique called channel swapping, which is, you don't need to worry about that right now, but you may have heard of that term. It's typically done in Photoshop where you change the red and blue, blue channels in your image. Um, and the foliage has some color in it, but it stays bright. The next one down is 590. And with 590, we're now into the, into the yellows and even the greens a little bit. And this produces a lot of color. We're, we're bringing in much more color into the image. And the foliage will be colorful. It'll generally be rendered cyan, greenish, but it tends to be middle-toned. It's not going to be as bright. With 590 images, you're going to need to do a lot more post-processing, and you need to be better with your processing software. Now, there are some that go even lower than that. They get weirder, like 550 or 4, 4, um, 490, I think, 495, some in there. Um, they produce kind of purple uh, foliage. But there is one other filter that is unique, and that's called IR Chrome. And it's, and it's only available from one of our conversion companies out there, the one that I use, Kalari Vision. This is a filter that emulates the old Kodak Aerochrome film. So you get red foliage and blue skies, but it requires, it's, it's a, you can get that as a conversion or you can use it as a filter, but it requires a special kind of conversion. Now I'm gonna talk about that special conversion in just a second, but let me just give you some notes on infrared filters, okay? You can add a lens filter on top of a sensor filter. So let's say you have your camera converted to a particular wavelength. You can put a filter on the lens to, to, to um, use it at a higher wavelength, but you can't put a lower wavelength filter on, on a um, high cutoff sensor. 
In other words, you can put a 720 or even an 830 filter on a camera that's converted to 590 or 665. No problem. You'll end up with a 720 or 830 look because it'll only allow those higher wavelengths to pass through. But if I, if I put a 590 filter on a 720 camera, it won't work because my sensor is going to block anything below 720. So you can use front filters in combination with converted cameras. Now, there's something out there that's been gaining popularity um, a lot, and that is called the full spectrum conversion. This is where they don't convert the camera to any one particular cutoff wavelength. It allows, they basically take the glass off the sensor almost entirely to just replace it with clear glass. Your sensor is now sensitive to UV visible and IR. Well, what that means is that in its native state, you really can't use it. It's a problematic conversion. You need a filter for every shot. So you can use an infrared filter, either on the lens or on the sensor for infrared. You can use a hot mirror filter, the IR cut filter, and use it as a visible light camera. There's even filters for UV, although there's not a lot of UV um, um, lenses out there. So the downside is you've got to use a filter. The plus side is that if you've got a mirrorless camera, there's a relatively new system that Kalari came out with, Kalari Vision, and I'll send links out to you guys so you can see what these products are that I'm talking about. They've, they've got a, a rear-mounted, what they call a clip-in system that works with certain mirrorless cameras, including Nikon, Sony, um, Fuji, um, and Canon. So if you've got one of those mirrorless cameras, you can use a, a filter that mounts onto the on above the sensor in the lens mount. You can't use that with a DSLR, just can't, because the mirror would be obviously in the way. So here's just some conversions compared. 780, this is standard. Uh, this is what you would get out of the camera, assuming that it was white balanced properly, um, or quote unquote properly. 780, 720, you can see as you go down the, the spectra, you get more and more color. And then this IR chrome, which is this unique look where you get the blue sky and the very blood red um, uh, foliage or anything that reflects infrared. And if you take these images and you perform what's called channel swapping, where you switch the red and, red and blue channels, usually again in Photoshop, um, you get this look. Now it doesn't work with 780 or IR chrome. Um, Th those you don't do this with. Um, 720, there's a little blue, and typically the foliage is pretty white, maybe has a tiny bit of yellow. 665, you see the foliage is a little bit yellow, the sky is a little bit stronger blue. 590, now we've got bright yellow foliage, almost looks like fall colors, and if you, if you correct it properly, you'll get a blue sky. 550, starting to look weird, you get the, you get the psychedelic Jimi Hendrix kind of look there. So this is these are all images that I just pulled from uh, Kalari's website. So um, you know these are not photos that I took. So let me tell you about. I kind of alluded to this the the benefit of a full spectrum mirrorless camera, um, and that's actually what I'm using now. I'll have a picture of it later. If you've got a mirrorless camera and you convert it to full spectrum, provided that you can use these um, clip-in filters, which you don't have to, but um, they're, they're um, advantageous, you can use it for any kind of infrared wavelength because you just need to get the right filter. That filter can be on the lens or it can be in the body, okay? Um, the reason why I don't like lens filters is because, number one, they get very expensive, and number two, um, you need different sizes for different lens filter threads. So unless you're just using one lens, um, you know, that set of filters can be big. Whereas the clip-in filters, they, they fit in a little case and they're quite small and you can just pack them and bring whichever one you want. But in addition to using this camera as your infrared camera, as your creative infrared camera, you can use it as a visible light camera. That means you now have a backup camera or even a, if it's small, like a travel camera, whereas before you would have had just a dedicated infrared body. OK, so there are some advantages to mirrorless cameras being converted to full spectrum um, using those rear mounted filters. OK, 
it's just the downside is that you got to buy all the different filters and that you know money adds up you know now there are a few things i should just point out with infrared camera uh, depending on what kind of camera you have focusing can be problematic if you're using a dslr and that's because infrared light doesn't focus in the same plane as visible light and unfortunately the the focus module in your dslr is tuned to visible light focus so you will oftentimes run into problems where you'd focus the camera or you would have to get it calibrated to a particular lens it's just not ideal so that's why i recommend using live view focusing whether uh, if, if you have a dslr or if you've got a mirrorless camera that's that's just how it works because in that case the camera is focusing with the sensor itself not with a separate um, autofocus module the other thing about infrared capture that can be a real problem, and it's usually the number one bugaboo, is white balance, okay? You can try to set the white balance in your camera using custom white balance setting. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. For example, I can get a pretty good white balance in my Nikon camera with 720. But if I set, but if I use 590, the camera, even if I shoot a gray card, the camera will return an error and just said it's unable to determine the custom white balance. Well, that means you're going to have to do something probably in raw. Okay, if you shoot in raw and use a raw converter, okay, you can adjust the white balance. Um, depending on your software, though, your software may not have the range to actually get the white balance correct. It depends on the software. So sometimes you you can do it out of the box. Sometimes you can do it um, with some modifications and customized profiles like with Lightroom, which I'll talk about. So the, the general uh, consensus is to use your camera's uh, software. Uh, and hopefully it even then you would have to use a custom white balance setting. It doesn't necessarily um, read the correct white balance out of the camera. Okay, so you will have to adjust white balance some way. Another thing is the lenses that I've mentioned. So some lenses have hotspots. And you know what? There's not much you can do about it. If it's mild, you can kind of work through it in post. But if it's a discrete bright disc, like what was happening with one of my Fuji lenses, you just can't deal with it. The only, the only um, solution is to um, not use that lens, OK? And then, as I mentioned, you can really sometimes see corner softness with wide angle lenses. The first camera I ever had converted was a Nikon one mirrorless camera, and it has a had a 10 to 30 millimeter zoom, which was the equivalent of like a, you know, 27 to, you know, 90 or something like that. Ideal range, you would think, except at 10 millimeters, it looked like someone smeared Vaseline on the on the lens itself. It was so soft to make the lens the lens practically unusable for infrared even though with visible it was a great lens no problem at all and that's those coatings working against you or you know for you depending on, on what wavelength you're in so here's my current kit right now um, i've got a nikon z6 i purchased it refurbished to save a little money um, i had it recently reconverted from 720 which was my default uh, to full spectrum and I use these filters that you can see in this little case. Uh, so what you see in the camera is the naked sensor. And then they put some magnets in there. And you can just attach these little metal framed uh, magnets right on top of the sensor. So I've got just the basic kit. I have the 720, the 590, the IR Chrome, or IR, what they call IR Chrome Light, and something called a Hot Mirror Pro 2, which is the visible light cutoff filter. And my main lenses are the Nikon 28 to 75 2.8 uh, and the Nikon 14 to 30 F4. I found that both of those perform quite well for infrared um, and, and obviously for visible. I have a list of lenses and whether or not they work well for infrared over on my website at luminescentphoto.com. So let's talk about, let me share some pictures to show you how I've used infrared over the years. Okay, starting with, my home state of Colorado. One of my first images was that little Nikon V1. Um, this was 590, but I processed it to be monochrome. 
you can see how the the leaves on the flower aren't bright white that's because it was 590 not 720 but on an overcast otherwise gloomy day it kind of came out pretty nice so i i like how this this photo came out i i took this probably in 20 2014 or 15 it's been a while it's one of my first images we got this cool little mountain town that's about an hour and change from me if i drive up the mountains called guffy this is another 590 in infrared image where i use that color to like boost up the the uh, the brightness of the colors to make it look like it was a deep black or 830 810 infrared image old rusty cars and in, in this was in the summertime it was green grass it, it's fun to do Talk about water. This was at the Denver Botanical Gardens. These are water lilies. And the cool thing, and you can't quite see it, but if you shoot into water, the infrared camera can penetrate uh, the water and it and will actually see underwater. So a lot of a lot of the the reflectiveness of the the shoots of the water lily, you can actually see the the root system of the water lilies, even though you couldn't really see it very well with your um, with the visit with the naked eye. Here's a 590 nanometer image, which I left um, in its sort of native state with, with the blue foliage and the orange sky. This is out on Eastern Colorado. It's great for subjects like this that are kind of graphical, nice cloudy summer day. And a cabin up in the mountains where this one was again with a 590, but I did a channel swapping to get the blue sky desaturated the foliage to make it look kind of like a 720 image. Another cool uh, 590 image that I processed to black and white. Recently, I have been photographing a couple times in, in the desert southwest, mainly in the Tucson and uh, Saguaro National Park areas. Recently had a workshop down there for infrared. Um, here's a 720 Im image from my Z6 with, uh, again, not channel swap, not monochrome. This is kind of like the colors as they come out of the, out of the camera. Here's one that I did convert to monochrome 720 at a at the um, the Mission San San Javier del Bach, which is just south of Tucson. Really cool, fun place to go. We took our our group there. This is in downtown Tucson, 720 infrared, no channel swapping, just left the colors. It was kind of an overcast day. There had been a storm that ran through. I liked how it rendered this image almost like a sepia tone. And then recently, I went back with my with my full spectrum camera and I shot this with that IR chrome light filter where you get that wild red foliage. Another 720 image from Tucson. Palm trees are great subjects for infrared as well as the architecture, you know, the, the old west down there. I like to travel overseas when I can do it with groups. Um, I like to travel overseas when I do it by myself, but um, when I go, I like to pack an infrared camera. And in the past, it was usually a little Fuji X-T1 that I had converted that I could use my Nikon lenses with an adapter. But now I've got my Z6 that I can use for both visible and infrared. So I've got a, a smaller body that I can pack. Um, so here's just some shots. This is in the Kuchenhof Gardens in the Netherlands, uh, 590 nanometer. And I, I added a little glow in post-processing. This is the daffodil blooms in the spring, really fun. When I went to uh, Ireland, Ireland is just glorious for infrared, all the green and all the clouds and all the stone, the old churches. So this is the Slane Castle in County Meath, 720 uh, IR. And, and this one, I used a filter on the lens because my camera was a 590, that Fuji camera. Scotland, the Stirling Castle, the, the cemetery, you can see the green grass and the, and the leaves just turn white. And it looks like a scene out of winter or something it looks like a snowy day on another trip i took clients down to belize on a cruise and we we took an excursion to the um the lamanai temple uh didn't have a lot of time it was midday shooting infrared camera saved the day because you know it made for some shots that were impressively dramatic that would have been really blah middle of the day light shots otherwise and again i converted this to black and white using silver effects one of my go-to plugins I love shooting in New York City. I'm hoping to do it again soon. Uh, Central Park is fantastic. This is 720. You can just see how the foliage just turns into a dream. Now, I wanted to, to mention um, this young lady, Melanie. I met her in, 
in front of the Flatiron building. She was posing for a friend. And I said, can I take your picture with infrared? And I mentioned infrared photography being amazing for portraits. So this was 590. That's what I had at the time. Um, look what I want to point out a couple of things. Um, not that she had any wrinkles or anything, but her skin is really smooth. Um, she has a tattoo and it just pops because again, that, that infrared light is, is um, reflecting from beneath the surface of her skin. So the tattoos just scream. And the other thing I want to point out, she's actually wearing sunglasses in this picture. So she's wearing dark glasses and the infrared light went right through them as if they weren't even there, just saw right through those dark glasses. So some sunglasses, they block um, infrared, other ones don't, hers didn't. So this was kind of cool. More from Central Park. It's just a, it just becomes such a fantasy world when you use an infrared camera. This is looking across um, at the uh, San, San Remo building in New York City near the Dakota building. Recently went down to San Diego for some shooting, but I brought my infrared camera, did a little work with my recently converted. This was 720 converted um, uh, using the channel swapping technique to get the white foliage and the blue sky along with this image of the Balboa statue in Balboa Park. And then for something completely different, I went with that IR chrome light filter, getting the, the sun, the sun um, uh, burst in the, in the corner by stopping down. This is also in Balboa Park, but this just looks like a scene out of some weird you know, horror movie or something. It's just kind of cool. Um, so a lot of fun with a, with a full spectrum camera. I've been shooting in South Dakota for, for over 10 years, and I bring my infrared camera there sometimes. Um, is an extra thing to do, especially in the middle of the day or when you're doing a side trip. So here's the Badlands in South Dakota, uh, 590 nanometer capture process to look kind of sepia tone monochrome. This is the town of Interior um, in Badlands National Park. It's actually a sit, it's a little town in the park. Um, and most of the time I don't shoot there, but with my infrared camera, it was perfect. So this is their Presbyterian church there. and. 720 nanometer infrared. And then taking a little side trip, going out towards Custer State Park and Wind Cave. There's a lot of barns and stuff out in rural South Dakota. So here's one of them, 720 infrared, but I processed it to retain some color. And here's a monochrome shot, Badlands National Park, cottonwood trees, um, which, which are great in the spring and summer in South Dakota. And here's another one that I processed, uh, 720. You can sort of see little bits of white foliage in there on the hill. Um, and I left some color in. So even though I used um, monochrome processing tool, I, I processed it to include some of the original color, just dialed back to make it look more, more like a sepia tone. So those are some of the places that I've been. You know, have infrared camera will travel, right? Um, let me talk just superficially about my processing because i think i deviate a little bit from what's considered um the uh, paradigm of, of infrared processing and that is i use lightroom and a lot of people don't like to use lightroom and they advise against using lightroom in fact um, almost to the point of dogma um, because out of the box lightroom doesn't work well with infrared but you can make it work with infrared and i think there's a reason um, why i like to use it why do I use Lightroom? Well, first of all, I'm going to jump to the, the bottom line, the bottom bullet point first. If you are a Lightroom user, which many of us are, or ACR Bridge, okay, either one, you're already using it for all of your other images. So why should you have a completely different processing workflow using different tools with different features that you have to learn? just to process your infrared images okay that's that's one the the traditional workflow requires a de uh, a conversion using some form of software whether it's your manufacturer software or something else and then they almost always tell you to do everything else in photoshop now you got to learn photoshop and then a lot of people find that intimidating well lightroom is already a great tool it's got very powerful editing tools it's an image catalog if you process infrared images from it, you'll actually get more color than you would with the, the native uh, uh, um, conversion tools, the native processing software. And the recent updates to Lightroom with its masking tools are just 
fantastic, the sky selections, the object selections and subject selection tools. Now, some of that's in Photoshop, that's true. But if I told you you didn't have to use Photoshop, wouldn't you prefer to not use Photoshop, okay? Especially if you're already using Lightroom or ACR. Now, there are some challenges. I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna sit here and say it's, it's something that's easy out of the box. And the biggest problem, um, and one that most people have probably realized very quickly is that the white balance slider doesn't go far enough to the blues, to the, to the low temperatures, um, to, to get your infrared images white balanced correctly. Some cameras are better than others, but some of them might slide that white balance slider all the way to the left and you still get a pink looking image. Now the workaround to this is, there is one, and I, I, I teach this, it's to create a custom um, camera uh, calibration profile camera profile with a white balance offset and there's software out there that's free from adobe and thank goodness it still works because you can just create this this offset which will allow you to white balance your your image pr properly so now you have a special camera profile okay you just have to learn how to do that now that was where i used to begin and end since then i've been able to add a creative profile using camera raw which includes color balance information and channel swapping information that allows me to perform the red blue channel swap directly in Lightroom on my raw images. Okay. And I've also learned to, to adjust some Lightroom tools to, to help minimize hotspots and that kind of stuff. But having a creative profile on top of the camera profile is a profound um, step. It's something that's existed, but not a lot of people know about it or use it. Again, it's not hard to do, but you have to have a little bit of um, uh, skill with um, camera raw. Now, if you do this and you have these custom profiles, you can not only set the white balance on your infrared images, but you can do the channel swapping. You'll get more color. You can use one camera profile with just different underlying settings from different infrared um, wavelengths. So for example, if you've got 720 and you've got 590 and you've got 665, you can use the same profile and then just tweak the underlying settings in, in you know, the color settings to, to properly white balance it and you make presets and life is good. And if you do this, you can have a one-click processing um, opportunity is very easy to do. I'm just going to show you some, some examples of that. So first of all, let me just show you the difference between what comes out of your camera's software and what Lightroom produces. So this is a Z6 image 720. I opened it in the Nikon software, which is NX Studio. Nothing wrong with that software. But you see, you get a very traditional muted, almost monochrome image with very little color. If I were to even crank up the saturation on this, you just wouldn't get much color out of that. That's what you're stuck with, the base conversion. Lightroom, on the other hand, gives me the image on the right, which as you can see, has dramatically more color. Now, I can make the image on the right look like the one on the left, if that's my creative goal, if that's my objective. It's very easy to do. I can't generate the image on the right from the one on the left because there's just no color information there. Okay, so that's one of those things. So let me just walk you through just some screenshots of what I'm trying to talk about when I'm using Lightroom. So if you were to just use default settings, you know, the, the Lightroom defaults, the Adobe color profile, daylight white balance, let's just say your camera didn't have a white balance. This is what you would get. And you could try to slide that white balance slider all the way over to the left. And it would, you know, depending on your camera, it might be close, or it might be terrible, you don't know. So my custom profile that I've made, which includes both the white balance offset and, and um, color detail, gives me this out of, the out of the box. And you'll notice if you look at the white balance slider over there on the right side of the screen, just look where it is. It's right in the middle. I can go either direction with this to, to, to fine tune the white balance to my liking. But here's the other cool thing. While, we're, while staying on the same raw file, in Lightroom, by just tweaking the my profile amount, I can channel swap it instantly. I didn't need to go to Photoshop. I didn't need to rasterize the image. I'm all in the same application. And this works for Camera Raw too, you can do it either way. 
Okay. Now there's some underlying things that you need to do to make it better, but, but essentially if you're willing to take a little time to, to create these, these profiles, then this is a very doable thing. And I think it's a game changer for the way, at least the way I process my images. I don't need to go to Photoshop as often, unless I have a specific reason to like some creative plugin, or I want to, you know, do, do um, effects, uh, things like that, or, or whatever. So I can stay in Lightroom for 90% of my, my images. Okay, so that's where I'm at. That's, that's, um, we're, we're basically at the end of the, the time I want to mention, um, I'm going to open up to questions in the chat window. I see there are already some there, so I'm going to get to those. I just want to mention that I do have a safari coming up June 1st through 4th. We're going to be in, in the surround Badlands, South Dakota and surrounding areas. It's in Wall, South Dakota. So we will go to the Badlands. We will go to some of the places that I had photos from in that South Dakota area. The nice part about an infrared workshop is there's no 4 a.m. wake up calls for sunrise. The grass is very green in the in June in in uh, South Dakota. It's springtime, so there'll be flowers. There'll be a lot of green grass, which is perfect subjects. And with any luck, we'll get nice puffy clouds too. So we should have some interesting um, atmosphere. We won't have to worry about smoke from fires that happened in the West this, that in the later part of the year. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. I have three spaces left. I'm only gonna I only have space for eight photographers. And if you want to register for this, it's op registration is open uh, via deposit through the end of this month at my website, luminescentphoto.com. So I'm going to open it up to questions. Let me um, pop open the chat window and uh, read these. If I can make it bigger on my screen. Okay. Um, so there's a question about using a full spectrum camera for night and astrophotography. I'll be honest, I've not used mine for that. So as far as pros and cons, I can't answer that. I know people do astrophotography with infrared, and it's pretty, pretty interesting um, because you're just capturing the you know, different wavelengths. Um, there's also a filter that you can get for astrophotography that's supposed to cut some of the... Um, the uh, light pollution, you know, from from uh, city lights. I have not tried those, but it's something I I hope to try in the future. Right now, um, I'm not doing any night photography. It's too darn cold out there <laughs> right now for me to go out. Um, I'm not I'm not interested in freezing myself to death to try to get the Milky Way here in Colorado. Uh, next question is. Um, um, Oh, there was a question about the recording. Yes, I'm going to send a link out to the recording. Okay, so I'll do that. Let me um, go through here. Um, if you convert a, a, your Nikon 7200 to infrared 590 with a universal calibration, I am assuming you're talking about a focus calibration, do you still need a custom white balance? Um, you will need a custom white balance, but unfortunately with Nikon, um, many of the Nikon cameras, if you're using anything other than 720, the camera is not going to hold a white balance. So your only recourse in that, in that case is to hope that the camera has a white balance for 720 and then custom white balance using software, um, Lightroom or other kind of raw software. So that white balance, I have no idea what the values will be. It just depends. It depends on your, on your custom profile. Um, but the values don't matter. You just adjust it till it looks right. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a process by eye kind of thing. Um, do I have any experience using the Nick filters for IR processing? Yeah, absolutely. I still use color effects and silver effects. Um, the latest versions, I use them. They work fundamentally the same way as the previous versions. The filters are all the same. There's a few new sliders in there. But yes, I, I like to use silver effects for monochrome. I like to use color effects to get that glow effect, things like glamour glow filter. Those are all my go-to um, post-processing tools after I'm done in Lightroom. Do I have any plans for an online class for this technique? Yes, but I'm trying to figure out the best way to teach it. <laughs> so that's the, the tricky part is that um, I don't, I, we would need um, a significant amount of time. So I am coming up with this. And, and if you signed up for this and you're on my mailing list, I'll send out information if and when I'm able to get that material together. A question about 
conversions. Um, where can you get a camera converted in Canada? I'm not sure. So the, the, the places that I go are in the US. There's Kalari Vision, which is in, and I'll send links to these out to everyone. They're in New Jersey. But obviously, you've got the international shipping problem. And then Life Pixel Infrared is in the Seattle area. There probably is one in, in Canada. I just don't know yet. So I'll have to loop back with you on that one. Okay, 